Good to have everybody here today. Thank you for joining us, and particularly thank you for those who chose to kind of brave the elements this morning. We had a, a stormy morning, as it were, but uh, you can always, in, it, in this true with God, you can always see anything that might be seen as adverse, like a thunderstorm, and say, wow, isn't the grass going to grow this week, or something akin to that. So, good things going on. I, you know, I don't know whether it times out right for the farmers. Y'all can check in with Jerry on that a little bit later on. We're really thankful to have you here. want to welcome everyone who's joining us on YouTube. Thank you very much for being with us today. If you're new to us in any way, we particularly want to point you to our website, www.ljchurch.org. You'll find a lot of information there and helpful things that can kind of push you down the way. Particularly want to mention um, if you have people who are asking about our lanyards, or again, as I said on the Thursday update, if you have folks that maybe are nervous about coming back to in-person services, there's a link right there to our COVID rollback, our, our, the way that we're rolling back our COVID pro policies and protocols and how we're handling that. So that'll be helpful there as well on the website. Hope on your way in, you got a copy of the Caring and Sharing. Again, that's also available on our website, and it's always easy to have the caring and sharing up on your phone, real easy to access that information, and particularly the prayer updates that are available there and on our Wednesday night announcements. Want to be sure that you continue to be aware that we have not uh, reinstituted uh, our passing of the trays during the Lord's Supper, so you will need your little individual set with you this morning, and this would be a great time if you don't have that. Also, we can continue to use contactless giving. There's a box in the back if you'd like to put your gifts there, but you can also do that online in several different ways, including the QR code that's on the screen. I've already mentioned it, but thanks for your cooperation with the lanyard process. I'm a particularly appreciative of those of you who, again, are nervous about the distancing and things like that, that you would wear red, and that just helps us still welcome you, but do it in a way that is appropriate for you. Remind you that this month of May, we're looking at Andrew Bonjanahar and his work in Indonesia, and particularly on the island of Neos. Really thankful for that. Want to remind you, hope you've picked up your baby bottle boomerang bottle and, and uh, you've got that and loading it up with change already or in some way you're getting ready to make a gift to the Pregnancy Help Center. Such good work goes on there. We've mentioned their names a couple of times. Want to be sure and remind you, next Sunday will be our first Sunday to have our summer interns with us here live and in person, both of them together, Kyle Cunningham working with our youth and Aaron Hudson working with our children. Uh, those of you who are Aggies, these are both Aggies. I didn't even have to say in the whole church said. <laughs> Um, we're, we're thankful to have them coming. I want you to have your attention particularly uh, looking for uh, ways in which you're going to have the opportunity to feed them and get to know them over the summer. Um, before I press on, I want to mention one thing, and, and I know that they aren't big stand-up people, but I see the Stevens. Could I have the Stevens stand up in the back? Uh, we've really enjoyed the blessing of their fellowship over the last five Five, we don't know. We'll say five years. Um, they are selling the house. They've already sold the house and going to be moving out of the area, and we're going to miss them. And please affirm and thank, thank the Stevens for their service. We have, we have a life that is to be worship. Amen? Everything we do is a gift of God. If, if we find our identity in Christ then we are a continual proclamation of his good news, and our, what we do in our life is a gift of worship. It's a sacrifice of praise to God. But there's something incredibly unique when we choose to take this time and we gather around the table of our communion and we choose to eat together from Christ that he offered us, and we, we get to open the heart and the lungs that God gave us and to exercise them in a unique way of bringing praise to the one who created us. Amen? Now, I hope that that makes you want to stand and engage in our opening song. Randy, lead us in worship.
children, praise kids, stage two, and limitless kids. How awesome it is for us to have a place where they can kind of do, go and do their own worship time and, uh, and also the teachers who spend time in there with them. It's so, uh, so great.
Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our mighty God, our Creator, as we gather today here to worship your holy name, we pray that you, that you fill our hearts, our minds, our soul, and help us to take in today's lesson and let us transform us, our ways of being, to be more like you. We pray that you help us in our daily lives, help us to be open-minded and help us to have a lovely attitude to those who surround us. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time as well, we thank you for all the graduates. We thank you for being with them and we ask that you continue to guide them and protect them in this new chapter that they're about to open up and begin. We pray that you allow them to know that you are there every step of the way and please help us to be there as well, dear God. We thank you for them. We thank you for all the parents for guiding them so far through this stage of their lives and we ask that you guide them as well, dear Heavenly Father. And all this we pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You don't have to go anywhere, though. Okay, I'll stay here and wait. All right, very good. Uh, if we uh, try to use this Sunday uh, typically to kind of honor those who have graduated from college, and I try to assemble that information sometimes well and sometimes not, I want to particularly point you to the Thursday update, this week's Thursday update, for more details on this list. Uh, I think you'll find it fun and informative. Just to remind you very quickly, with uh, bachelor's degrees, and again, for Kelsey Phillips, it's her second bachelor's degree, a bachelor's of science in nursing, uh, Kelsey Phillips-Koss and Harrison Hewitt and Ozzy Garcia. Uh, those that we mentioned on, on, uh, on Thursday that graduated with upper-level degrees include Drew Ritchie um, and uh, Jameson Hunter, and Jameson is here. Jameson, please stand. Let us congratulate... Dr. Hunter among us. We're really thankful for that. Kind of cool. Also, now we start all the ones that I messed up. And so those of you who watch Thursday know that I, I messed up on a couple of them. Misty Wilson did not get another degree from uh, Brasport College. I promise you I didn't make that up out of my head. Misty Wilson graduated back in December uh, but didn't get to walk until this May, and she graduated with Master's of Education in Curriculum and Instruction focus from the University of Texas at Arlington. You'll get to see, I'm fairly certain Misty will be here next week, and you'll get to see her in person. want to, you to congratulate her. Uh, so again, messed up uh, with uh, uh, Randolph. Said, uh, Cole got, did not get a bachelor's degree. Kyle got a master's in biomedical science. Uh, and again, that was back in December, but he walked in May. Very proud of that. And I've got all three of them up there just kind of to let you know, the triplets. Kind of fun. Uh, Travis graduated last May in 2020 with a BS in agriculture science. He's working at Holt Caterpillar in Austin. Samantha graduated in December of 2019 with a BS in civil engineering, and she works at Jones Carter in the woodlands. We are very blessed to be able to call these young people uh, our children. Amen. And we celebrate with them this, this next great accomplishment. So please give your affirm <laughs> affirmation. So since we had so many of these neat children have grown up to be unbelievable, except Jameson still texts Sandy goofy things back and forth. Oh, y'all need to, y'all both need to grow up. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> He's a doctor. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place.
Scripture reading today will be Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God Amen. that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Saint in the offering. 
was not good enough for God, just so you know. Let's give God a big hand. Yeah. I appreciate Randy Fry taking on the task of reading that long section. I wanted you to hear it all. Uh, it is what closes, whether it's the greatest chapter in Romans or in the New Testament or in the Bible is debatable, but it is a great and powerful statement. It begins with this phrase, what then are we to say about these things? And technically, you have to figure out what you're going to do before you start reading the rest of the passage. What is he summarizing here? In some ways, he could be summarizing everything from 27. And 27 is that statement, all things work together for those who love the Lord. And that's a possibility. We make that great proclamation, amen, that, that when we're with God, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, things will come together. And again, be sure you understand, it is not about my good, my earthly, the good that I think of in terms of, oh, I want more money, I want a better house, I want, a, you know, I want to be skinnier, whatever the good may be. Whose good is this? God's good. Whose good is this, church? And so it could well be that that's all that he's referring back to. Except that when we read it, it's hard not to look broader than that. This almost seems to be a summary statement for everything, at least through from chapter 5 till now, but I would actually say it kind of wants to sum everything up from the introductory paragraph, which goes through in chapter 1 through verse 18. He all points it all forward and says, I, I'm looking at all that I've said, and all I can do is say, yes, and hallelujah. Amen? And let's just very quickly kind of summarize what's gone on in this book. You may choose to write a different set of summaries, and I would love to hear your summaries. Uh, there are two things that affect my summaries. One, I want to get them in as small a space as possible. Somebody say, because I want to get them done as quickly as possible. Uh, and number two, uh, I'm the one who got to choose. So I'd love to engage with you in this conversation. The summary of the book, everything that Romans is about is the idea that the righteousness of God is re being revealed in the gospel and all we can do is say amen. It's an incredible conversation that Paul is having. And again, you always hear these questions back and forth, this conversation that Paul is having with, I don't think, specific opponents, but just people that he has spoken to over the years. He wants to have a conversation them, with them and talk about the way God's salvation has been played out and what Jesus has done in the great proclamation of the gospel. That proclamation starts with wrath, and we've said this many times before. Chapter 118 through 318, the wrath of God revealed against Gentile and Jew alike. And we are all, there are no exceptions, and Paul would include himself. Without Christ, without the gospel, we are all trapped in sin. From there, he picks up and talks about the fact that God justifies those who live by faith. And that's a powerful, overarching kind of statement. So his grace is proved greater than sin. I would say that that's a statement that we all kind of have just kind of gotten used to. And yet it ought to be a huge hallelujah that light overcomes darkness, amen? And God's grace is bigger than sin. And while we can talk about this in cosmic and kind of global kinds of ways, we can also talk about it in a very individual and very unique to you kind of way. Because you know where sin has trapped you. But you can affirm in everything that you do in how you respond. And by the way, not just respond to sins in the past, but failures in the present. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm always the best husband I ought to be. And I can either let that be the ruling and dominating tape voice in my head, or I can say, you know what? God's grace, as experienced through Sharon, is greater than my failures. And somebody says, amen. you can say amen for me, but I happen to know that you need to say amen for you as well. And that's not about taking good care of Sharon. That's about whatever area of life that you find yourself in. Then as chapter 6 opens, we're going to talk about identity a lot here. In Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, sin, sin was put to death, and the law, the law that could not be fulfilled by our own kind of acts to be lawful, instead was fulfilled by Christ's death and resurrection. And that runs all the way into chapter 7. And then from 7 7 to 8 30, to where we are today, again, where our statement, what are we going to say in response to all this? Our new identity in Christ is victorious over sin as we are formed, not by being people who are somehow or another under the subjection of the rule of, of sin, and not even people that are necessarily holding up and saying, look how good I am at keeping God's law. Instead, we are victorious by the law of the Spirit. And we all say, Amen. In response, Paul will start this section, and we go back to the courtroom. The, uh, the original language here has all these words that are associated with a legal case. And so he asks these, and again, we've experienced this before. Uh, the, the lawyer will stand and make an objection to Paul's proclamation of the, of the salvation brought about by the gospel of Jesus. And here is just bullet fire. By the way, this is one of the reasons that I would point you all the way back when it says... When we hear all these things, how do we respond to all these things? We're pointing all the way back to chapter 1 because it has been these occasional statements that are, that are these, these objections, as it were, that the lawyer stands up and gives, and now it's just this bullet fire of these objections. First of all, in 831, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, what I need to let you know is that the objection language has changed here. Prior to this point, the objection language are the people who are objecting to Paul's proclamation of the gospel. They're saying, wait a minute, it can't just be this by grace through faith. Because where is the law? Or how about I just get sin even more so that God's grace can be even bigger? Here it switches. Because it is the prosecutor, it is the idea that Paul himself are stating these objections. Objections to any identity except our identity in the Spirit through Christ. Any way of living that might be different than the idea of living in the Spirit and in the law of the Spirit. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? In 833, the next question... Who will bring any charge against us? I, I love it. Uh, Randy and the words on the screen were both in the NIV. But there's been a recent update to the NIV, and Randy was reading the one that's in my Bible. There's been an update, and they put this statement in. Who, who can bring any charge against us? Is it Christ? That may be the next line. And then on the screen it said, no one. Because the question that is the statement about Jesus. Again, in the original language, it's a question. You take Jesus, for instance. Take Jesus, for instance, and how is he and what he has done any kind of a charge against us? And so the answer, naturally, is no. No one is there to condemn us because Christ is the one who intercedes for us. In 834, who is the one? Not just a charge. Get it? So now, who stands, Paul standing in the seat of the prosecutor, and you've got the, the objectors over there, and then they, and he said, so who is it? Who is it that's against us? Who is it will bring, by the way, this should sound kind of legal, who is it will bring a charge? And finally, who is it will condemn you? And Paul continues, who's the one who condemns us? 835 There ought to be very few 
few statements in Scripture that capture your heart like this one does. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Now you kind of have to envision here of reflecting back on the gospel. You have to read the gospels and recognize all the places that Jesus went with the gospel. It was kind of interesting. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a manger. He was born in a, in a feed trough, in a stable, on the backside of the little town that, you know, didn't carry all that much weight anywhere. And if you ever thought that who you were wasn't significant enough, then guess what? Jesus has walked right there with you. Jesus went to the waters of baptism. Jesus went into the houses of what was typically called sinners. But what we recognize is even when the Pharisees aren't objecting, you're in the house of a sinner, Jesus is touching and healing and interacting with all the wrong sort of people. As a father... There was a time when Elise was dating, and there were concerns about don't want to date the wrong kind of person, kind of deal like that. In fact, we had, she knew this, you've heard this before. If she wanted to go out with somebody, they had to come and meet me. There was a young man at church who thought that rule didn't apply to him because he was from church. I said, you were wrong. <laughs> but bottom line is, the people that Jesus hung around with, the people that Jesus broke bread with, and the people that Jesus would choose to touch, to lay hands on, were not the sort of people that you always wanted to say, Hey, Elise, that'd be a great guy to date. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Jesus' love took him to Jerusalem in that fateful week. Jesus' love took him to the upper room in which he said, my body and my blood. Jesus' love pushed him into the most illegitimate courtroom, courtrooms that the world maybe has ever seen. And Jesus' love laid his hand down on the cross. And it wasn't some enigmatic what. It wasn't a hammer and a nail. It was a person may have been two or three people. If you look at Mel Gibson's rendering of this scene, it's two or three people that are pulling his arm so that it's fully flexed and then placing the spike in the area that stretches the body absolutely the most. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? The answer over and over and over to all of these questions is always, say it with me please, no. No one, nothing, and never. It is an affirmation of God and an affirmation of Christ and an affirmation of a spirit that he says no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors who, through him who loved us. I'm not exactly sure how we become more than conquerors. But there are times in our life when we, when we kind of step into something and it, and it comes together in a way that it's almost like it's not our efforts that made it possible. But we kind of see the, everything coming to make our victory and our ability to accomplish things possible. And here it is that we are more than conquerors. And I think a big part of this language is the idea of not that you have a good enough sword hand and not that you have a strong enough shield and not that your shoes aren't fit well enough and your strength good enough. It is you are more than a conqueror because just like Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but they crossed the Red Sea to freedom but what happens in their aftermath? They defeat the most powerful army in the whole world without lifting a single finger. More than conquerors. And that is who we are in Christ and with the Spirit. So the yes is in and through and by the Spirit. Chapter 8 began with this idea that no 
No, the life before baptism was a life where every time we intended to do something good, it always seemed like we couldn't accomplish the good that God wanted. But when we let go of that idea that somehow or the good is going to be found in me, instead the good is in Christ, and I will take God and Christ's good into me in the indwelling of the Spirit, that when we hear this no, we recognize it is God's yes of the Spirit. I've been putting something similar to this up each week. That our yes in the Spirit is an affirmation that I'm not living to earn what Jesus has done for me. And it's so easy for us to get caught in that trap. That I can be good enough. I can get it right enough. I can somehow stack up all my good and it will earn what Christ has done. We'll never get there. Paul comes back to it over and over and again in the first eight chapters. Can't get there. Secondly, I'm living in response. I'm not living to earn. I'm living in response to what God has accomplished in me. And I will tell you that it is very difficult to live in the Spirit until that mindset, that shift of gears from the idea that what I do is about earning something that God has given and instead what I do in my life, the way I walk, the way I talk, the way I think is about responding to what God has accomplished. There may be very few switches in your life when you say, Spirit, come, that the Spirit wants to invade your heart and your mind and your soul so that your body can begin the process Your strength can begin the process of saying, I'm not going to do it to earn. I'm going to do it to say thank you. When you say no to the things that bring brokenness to the world, you're not earning something from God. You're saying, thank you, God, for the freedom to choose. When you choose to not act in hateful ways, but to act in the love that God gives, then you're not not saying, oh, look at me. I got this love thing down, aren't I good? Instead, you're saying, thank you, God. Because you know what? It took more love for you to love me than for me to love anybody else on this earth. Amen? It is about saying thank you. I have the Spirit of God partnering with me in all things. I am never alone in the process of being who Jesus wants me to be and doing the things that God wants me to do. And maybe above all else, I don't know, I love that song, Sweet Seat Spirit. I kind of wonder, I put it on the list of suggested songs, and sometimes Randy just plugs them in before he reads through them, and I happen to know he doesn't like high notes very much. And so I'm not sure he read that song before he said, oh, that'll be a good one. And I'm so glad he did. (laughs) Aren't you? Sweet expression on each face. Our worship, our time together, our ability to praise Him. I don't know if you feel it every once in a while. And I realize that not all of you are into that idea of feeling something. And that's okay. Because I'm going to affirm the truth. The Spirit is with us in all things. The Spirit is filling our voices when we choose to take the lungs that God has given us. By the way, I've heard some of you at games. you got lungs. You can get with it. When you use those lungs to say, I'm going to sing a praise of loving God and His greatness and His holiness. But for those of you who are okay, comfortable with the idea, every once in a while, sitting there, the Spirit is moving. It's no longer my voice. It's no longer my lungs. It is something the Spirit has moved and made it greater. Amen? I am never alone in all things. And so finally, the yes of the Spirit. So that my identity can be. So that my identity can be all, can be Christ above all. And again, you say, yeah, 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 yeah. It'll all come together when God makes everything new, right? When when we get to that heaven stuff, then it'll all be good. No, 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 no. My identity be can be Christ above all, now and in eternity. So how do we answer that yes in the Spirit? How do we become a person whose identity is put squarely and completely on who God is and on who Christ is? 
answering the yes in the Spirit. When someone asks you who you are, you have lots of opportunities response, don't you? But the Spirit tells us is that when somebody asks who we are, we are God's child. Say that with me. Who are you? God's child. You see, it's a, a powerful thing. There's so many things that the world wants to put labels on us. By the way, one of the main ways that the world tries to use labels is to try and separate us. To try and put you over in that corner and me over in this corner. And there's particular effect in the idea of not only am I going to put you in your corner, but I'm going to make you feel even more isolated in your corner. There is no identifying marker greater than the marker that says, I am God's child. Now, there's a how to that. Is how next? David, what's next? How is next? Hallelujah. I love it when it comes together. I am not God's child. Now, by the way, just want to real quickly say, every single person in all of creation that has ever lived or will ever live between first creation and new creation is a child of God. They don't exist except for the breath of God. Somebody say, amen. And, and if I were to make a quick statement, and that starts at conception in the womb. But the other half of the sentence is, who am I, needs to be defined by not an old self that was a slave to sin, but a new self that is a slave to righteousness and is, a, is indebted to Christ and is filled with the Spirit. I am God's child, and this is where the how comes in. Because this was a big debate in the church there at Rome. There were those Jews who said, we are God's children because we are related to Abraham. And Paul over and over and over again tries to affirm, and, and we're not done with his affirmation, the children of Abraham are children of faith. And faith leads us into a relationship with Christ. Amen? And that relationship with Christ will never be about how good I am. I've already mentioned this today, so I'm not going to build upon it a whole lot. I am God's child, and I am God's child because God has chosen to make me right with Him. I am justified by Christ. I can make the case... That while there is a process that will take place when God makes everything new and, and, and all those who have died prior to that and all those who are still alive at that moment will go into and move into what might be called a glorified body. That is what Scripture calls it. It is the same body that Jesus had after the resurrection. Okay? That's a change. That's a big change. Somebody say amen. Anybody get up sore this morning? No more. Anybody ever once in a while have something that kind of sticks you in the side and says, oh, wait a minute? And the answer is no more. I'm looking for the day in new creation when I can understand everything that Kyle is saying because it's beautiful. But the thing I want to affirm is that the justification that comes through Christ has fitted me for heaven. I'm going to continue the process of transforming the outside part of me for the rest of my life. But right here and right now, and I don't understand it completely, but I am fully equipped in God's righteousness. I will be in no better standing with God on the day that Jesus comes back, then I am right now. Because what Jesus has done for me through the cross and what God has chosen to do for me in making me right through Him will not change between now and then. How can I be a child of God? It is because I am justified by Christ. And why is it? Why, right? No, what? Okay, that's all right. Who you are 
child of Christ, what you are is a servant of Christ. This is the Spirit saying yes. Got some folks that have doctorate degrees that didn't just a couple of weeks ago. We got some folks with master's degree and bachelor's degree. We got folks that are heading off into jobs. And they're thinking, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to be able to do this thing, and I'm going to earn money, and people are going to pay me for doing something that I've gotten paid a lot of money to get this degree on and all those kinds of things. And I want to say to you, and by the way, I've been doing what I've been doing for the better part of 40 years in my life. We're coming up on it. I've been ministry of some sort in different ways. But even the idea of being a staff minister, someone who's paid to be a youth minister, be an education minister, whatever it's been, be a preacher, those are all informed by the idea that I am doing anything and everything about what I am, who I am and what I do, who I am as a child of Christ, God, child of God's child, and what I do is being a servant of Christ. So Samantha's got that civil engineering degree. And I'm not sure all the ways that moving earth and hydrology and all those kinds of things can be about being a servant to Christ, but I know Samantha well enough to know that she's figuring it out. We've got folks that are going to graduate from high school. And they're still figuring some things out every once in a while. But what I know is that if their vision changes from what can I go and get good money doing, and you know what, today in our economy it may not be what can I go get good money, what can I go and get a job in. But how can God equip me to be His servant in His places doing His good? To be a servant of Christ, and why? To be God's good. The Spirit says, yes, in our inner being, you are God's child. And by the way, there are going to be lots of voices that are going to say no, aren't there? But the Spirit says, yes. The Spirit says, how? is because you've been justified. And too often, we'll get distracted with voices that say, I'm going to try to do, be good enough and earn this. The Spirit will say, what you're here to do is serve. And what the Spirit will continually remind you of is that you can be. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you put your trust in Him and allow the Spirit to live in you, that you are right now being God's good wherever you go and whatever you do. Amen. And that is a great calling. The statement is, we are more than conquerors. Conquerors over the brokenness in our life, conquerors over the brokenness in the world, conquerors over the idea that sin and death somehow has the last word. We are more than conquerors. If you want to be involved in a conversation about how to make that a greater reality in your life or how to start that in your life, we would be excited to participate in that conversation with you. If you're online with us, there's a number on the screen, 979-217-3300 that you can send us a text and that will start a conversation and we welcome you to that conversation. But I want the last words today to be God's words through his servant Paul that he shaped nearly 2,000 years ago. So stand for God's invitation and we'll sing a song immediately following this. Picking up in verse 29... God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines of the life of his son. The son stands firm in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. And after God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously competing what he had begun. So why do you think, with God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he won't gladly and freely do for us? 
And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think that anyone is going to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us both now and forevermore. Let's sing. People need the Lord.
So you'll need to locate your communion element here. I'll have to agree with Alan's assessment. Romans chapter 8 has to be one of the most encouraging chapters of the Bible. Uh, but the reality is there are also a lot of things going against us every day that really try to undermine that understanding that God's with us. Uh, you know, we're just getting through a year of a pandemic. How many of us have ever been through a pandemic before? I don't, I don't think anybody has seen something like that, where you get to be isolated in your house for a year plus at this point. Uh, but this separation can also happen when we go away from home, you know, whether it's going to college, which some of our high school people will be going to, and, and you, get in, you get into a different environment where it's not cool to do this Christian thing. You know, it's not cool to say, hey, yeah, Jesus is the son of God, because, you know, that's not a tangible thing for so many people. Well, maybe it's when we lose a loved one and we're sitting back and saying, God, how could this happen? This person was so important to me. But really, that's just us allowing evil to take us away in the relationship to God. You know, as Alan said, nothing can separate us from that. And I want to go back to John 3.16, a very familiar verse for most of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And a little further down it says, light has come into the world. It's the light of Christ. It's, it's God sending his son. That opened up such a great relationship for those of us who weren't Israelites. You know, for those of us who weren't Jews, prior to Christ coming, we were going to be out of luck. Christ came, and the gates were open for us. So although things might want to get in the way of our lives, we have one thing that can help us kind of focus our hearts and focus our minds back on Christ. We're, we're, not, we're not going to bring in a goat or bring in a bull and cut it in half and burn it on an altar today. That's, that's not the sacrifice. That's not the thing that brings us closer to God these days. The memorial that we have that brings us back to Christ and his sacrifice is this communion service. So keep that in mind. It's a, it's a binding part that brings us back in our relationship to him. Let that be something that each week can help you draw closer to take your week forward. Let's pray. Dear God, we're so thankful for your son. We're so thankful for the gift of his life, the message that he brought, the life that he lived, the miracles that demonstrated his power over nature, power over even death, and the promise that that opened up for us. We thank you that he, although he was hesitant, he was willing to go to the Christ, cross. He was willing to die as a sacrifice, a one-time sacrifice for us. And we pray that we can open our hearts and our minds to him as we partake of this bread now and to remember that body that was sacrificed for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ, Christ died. His blood was shed on the cross. The blood that now cleanses us from the sin in our lives. Let's continue our prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the blood of Christ. We're thankful that it washes us clean, that your grace establishes the relationship from that point on that we can have with you. We're thankful for opening that relationship to you. And we praise you for your kindness and your love and your protection in all things. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? 
For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Well, again, we want to thank everyone for the gifts, the generosity that the congregation has had over the past year when there have been so many challenges that would get in the way of uh, our finances and our giving to the church. Um, we continue to really recognize the support that everyone has given. But God has supported us through all things. Uh, the tough times that we have in the United States, when you look over in a place like India, just seem insignificant. And the blessings that we have in here are just so overwhelming compared to so much of the world. And so uh, it's good that we have the opportunity to, to put forward in a collection that can benefit so many people. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your generosity in all things. We thank you for uh, the, the finances that we have and the opportunities that we have. We pray that you will guide those that, uh, that direct these funds to spend them in ways that will further your cause, that will support the community and the world. We pray that you will be with our missionaries who are uh, serving us in, in other lands, that you will protect them and continue to guide their efforts. We pray that you'll be with our local staff here and, and continue to bless the efforts in this community. In all things, we thank you for everything that you've done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Once again, I want to add my thank you for your attendance here this morning. I appreciate it. Um, the singing is always good. It kind of struck me this morning as being a little bit extra good. So I want to say thank you to each and every person because it takes all of us Amen. to do that. Now, our, our singers and leaders put a lot of extra effort into this to make it the success it is, but it takes every one of us. Some of us contribute most, like myself, by maybe not singing. Either that or if you remember the old records with the old white noise, the crackling and popping, I'm the white noise. But anyway, thanks everyone. It's, it really is great. And I just want to say thanks to everyone for your participation in that. Uh, a couple of extra names we need to add to our prayer list is Wanda Long, who is home from surgery. And also Robin Loftus is also home from surgery. You need to keep them as they continue to recover uh, from their surgeries. Um, let me get my notes here. Uh, wedding shower coming up, uh, Lindsay Author. Uh, there is a small misprint. We're going to blame Alan. Everything that's wrong is Alan's fault. Okay, whatever. It says May the 6th, it's June the 6th. So be sure and look at your bulletin, June the 6th, uh, celebrating Lindsay Author and her uh, future husband. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Uh, life groups, let's continue with our life groups. Uh, if you're not in a life group, and I know sometimes we have this format and we're going to get together and we're going to study, and that's good. But as I pointed out, we call them life groups. We do not call them study groups. It's more about just getting together, fellowship, being with one another, a uh, very important thing. Our opening doors ministry next week, we will be talking about the office and the finances. Uh, this has been some very good eye-opening information. One thing that we did here a while back was benevolence, and I think people were very impressed with benevolence. And so immediately following services, we're going to have an uh, open house, so to speak, over here. Uh, Gary McBrayer will kind of be leading on that. If, if you want to see our clothes closet, if you want to see the uh, that groceries you've been buying and the stuff like that, and so uh, see some of the good work that we are doing here, that you're doing here, uh, that we're able to take a part in. Uh, next Sunday, we will be uh, celebrating our high school graduates. We have eight of them. Next Sunday morning, we're going to call it a uh, blessing. And then that Sunday night will be a celebration. The names, there's eight of them. That's a lot. They're in the bulletin. There may be three names that you look at and you're like, I don't think I know this person. That's because our youth 
and this is not a fluke, this is the norm, have been bringing their friends to invite them to come to our service. If we would all follow the examples of our youth, we would be discussing how much bigger are we going to make the building? Or how many services are we going to have because it's not big enough to hold everybody? So congratulations to the youth on their achievements in high school and their achievements on bringing their friends to Christ. Thank you very much for that. They're good, good uh, to them. Uh, and that's all that I have this morning. Uh, thank you very much. And if you would, join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We just want to praise, honor, and glorify you. Uh, you created the world. You created man. And when we turned our backs upon you, you sent your son to die in our place. Lord, we just praise and honor you for this. Lord, we just ask that the things we have done this morning have glorified you, have honored you, has uh, held your name up to the highest heavens. Uh, Lord, we just ask your blessings upon each one here. We just ask you to bless our college graduates, ask you to bless our high school graduates as they, another stone, stepping stone into their uh, life in the world. Uh, just help us to be there, to guide them, to uh, encourage them, to congratulate them, to praise them, and to bless them. And Lord, they are a praising blessing to us as well. Thank you very much for all this. Uh, we just ask these things in your son's name. Amen. I'll be standing.